Good morning, everybody. God bless you. Welcome to those who are joining online. We love you. My name is Pastor Mike. We're so glad you're with us. If you're looking for a home church, please email me at ChristTheRedeemerDBG at gmail.com. Love to take you out for coffee. And for my friends who are here, I love you all so much. I'm glad you're with us this morning. If you've got your Bibles or your Bible app, go ahead and open up. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 22 today. Exodus chapter 22. Exodus 22, verse 21. Now this morning, we're going to look at a very, very debated issue within the body of Christ. Within the body of Christ, especially the last 10 years, there have been those who have struggled on one side and said, the most important thing is that we preach and we deal with people's inside stuff. Deal with their spiritual issues, their spiritual baggage. And there's been another member of the body of Christ who said, no, what's important is that we focus on the outer man or the outer woman dealing with their physical needs, such as feeding or clothing them. But friends, I've got good news today. You can do both. Oh, give me a better amen than that. Amen. We're talking the whole gospel for the whole person. Listen now as I share with you a story from the ancient church who was dealing with this issue of helping the oppressed, helping those who needed justice. And in this case, it was the poor, the the orphan, the widow, those who were marginalized. Church history tells us that Christians were so obedient to Jesus' command to take care of the poor. The gospel reaching both the inner man and the outer man. I'm going to say my Greek word wrong, so please forgive me. But it was called Zena Dekia, which were poor houses for the homeless, for men and women who couldn't find beds, a clean place to sleep, new clothes. They gave them everything, including the gospel. Now check it out. There was a Caesar named Julian the Apostate. How would you like to have that name? Julian the apostate was not a believer. And here's what he said. Listen to his testimony. Julian the apostate, he said, or the story goes, he was embarrassed. He was embarrassed at the obvious inferiority of pagan charity and sought to establish networks of same houses for the poor to compete with the Christian welfare agencies. The Christians were doing so well that they were turning the pagans by the droves to the gospel as they ministered to the whole man. He said, quote, precisely, it's disgraceful that when no Jew ever has to beg and the impious Galileans or the Christians support not only their poor, but ours as well, that all men see that people lack what we can't provide, end quote. They were so busy living out the incarnational message of Jesus that it affected the Caesar himself. Friends, this morning, let's look at our text with eyes of love in Exodus 22. Let's look at it through the gospel. Let's take a moment and look afresh at how we can care for the poor, the the oppressed, those who are in categories of being marginalized. And let's draw wisdom in two specific ways. I think Exodus would teach us this morning, number one, how to live like delivered people. And number two, Deal with the issue that people are people and not projects. Let's live like delivered people and also realize that people are people and not projects. Here we are in Exodus chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 21. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear them and hear their cry and my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. Now, here we go diving right into our text. Israel had been freshly delivered by God from the land of Egypt. Delivered as slaves now living under this amazing covenant. This covenant that offered them freedom from oppression. Now you know that covenants are are equivalent today of contracts. There are these binding agreements. And so God had said, I'll deliver you from slavery. You'll now become my people. I will become your God. And you have to now live like free people. And free people in my covenant means obeying my commandments. Now Exodus so far, up to these 20 chapters, has been dealing in a lot of ways about how to live out God's commandments. You see, they may have been slaves freed on the outside, but there was something big that God was trying to do. He was trying to get the inner slave free as well. 
Friends, he was trying to get them to live inside out. And an inside outside living in our text means dealing with the most vulnerable among us, the most weakest and marginalized in a merciful, Christ like or God way. He deals with three groups in our text the sojourner, which is a fancy word for a foreigner or a stranger, widows, and orphans. Now, why? Why are these groups so important? Because Israel had themselves been sojourners in Egypt. They had been slaves, and in their slavery, their taskmasters had killed their husbands, and many wives had become widows, and many children had become orphans. They themselves were a living example of what God was about to do over the whole earth, which we will now see in the gospel. Now, under God's contract with them, he wants them to live like delivered people, especially among those who are foreigners, widows, and orphans. He wants them to receive mercy. Now, here's the point. Did Israel do it? Did Israel take care of the poor, the widow, and the marginalized? Come on, shout at me, y'all. We know by the time the prophet Jeremiah comes around, around chapter 7, he says specifically, you oppress the poor, the orphan, the widow, you take bribes to crush them. Oh friends, what is it like to be free on the outside, but such a slave on the inside that you could look at somebody who is in a horrible situation and think, how can I capitalize? Friends, this is why this Old Covenant text in Exodus 22 is pointing out our need to be born again and delivered from the inside. Give me a strong amen. Somebody help me out there. This text is letting us know where Israel failed, Jesus succeeds. This text is letting us know that what's on the inside, this old man, this old woman, needs to be born again. Hear afresh why a heart that would oppress an orphan and a widow and a sojourner needs the born-again message. Jesus said this, Truly, truly, I tell you, in the Greek, it's amen, amen. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Because Israel's story is the human story. Israel's story is just letting us know that this one group of people who should have known better because of what of God's done is the story of all of us. And Jesus comes and says, You too, who are living as slaves on the inside, must be born again or you will never see the kingdom and it's evidenced by the way you treat the most marginalized among you jesus tells us as moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so must the son of man be lifted up and all who believe on him will have eternal life now look afresh at our text look at exodus 22 god says it is so serious that if you mistreat them his anger will burn and he will bear the sword, and you yourselves will become widows and fatherless. Friends, hear me now. People use a text like this, and they'll say, God is nothing but a petty, moral, and malicious monster. But Jesus lets us know something quite different. Capital punishment existed in Israel because not God's heart being hard, but because humans' hearts were this hard. God is letting us know that this check, this capital punishment is there because of the serious hardness of men's hearts. Jesus told us something similar about the issue of divorce. He said in Matthew chapter 19, verse 8, he says, Moses gave you the certificate of divorce because of the hardness of your hearts. God is not a moral monster. He has to use the most extreme measures because the level of evil is so large that the law would expose it for what it is, a raging monster. God speaks to Moses that he will check this level of evil, that if people who ought to live like delivered will oppress the marginalized, capital punishment would be the only way to scare them into the recognizing good sense. Oh, friends, but now under the new covenant, we can be empowered where Israel failed. Now hear me, the church of Jesus Christ, our church, we should have our sights set on the most marginalized, weakest, and broken among our culture. Hear what James says. Hear it now. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Friends, if we're going to live like delivered people, we've got to live it out among those who are suffering the most in our culture because that's the gospel message. 
Jesus came among darkness and brokenness and lived to deliver us. And now we too are being sent to live among those who are orphans, who are widows, who are afflicted. And the story is we can have our hard hearts born again and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Friends, the ancient church, as I read to you in the beginning, saw this as a primary means to evangelize because they took these words from Matthew seriously. Living like delivered people, Jesus tells us in Matthew 25, Truly I say to you, as you do it under one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Let me say that again. Truly I say to you, if you've done it under one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it unto me. Friends, Jesus takes this very personally. He then says, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. And you did not clothe me. You, when I was sick and in prison, you didn't visit me. Friends, at our church at CTR, one of the things that we constantly do each week is we have an offering that we take for those who are struggling among us in our community precisely because we are delivered people. We are delivered people. I'm not trying to get delivered by doing good work. Somebody help me. I am delivered, so therefore I am taking care of others among us. Let us live like delivered people, and it's springing from the power of the, of, of the Spirit. Friends, the whole person needs the whole gospel, which is the inner and the outer man receiving the goodness of Jesus Christ. Now, while we are not under this same capital punishment you see in Exodus 22, friends, hear me now for the fear of the Lord. Jesus takes this issue of caring for the marginalized personal. He says at the judgment seat, there is no room for stinky old man at the judgment seat. Now, I'm going to help you with this. You all know that I'm a cleaner by trade when I'm not pastoring. There was this certain thing at a public account that I had that when I opened the door, I could sense a certain aroma as I opened the door. The aroma announced what had already been there. You all know what I'm saying? I don't want to go into details. It's G-rated around here. Friends, I want to tell you that your good works will precede you as an aroma to the judgment seat. And they're either going to smell a lot like Jesus or they're going to smell a lot like the old man. Oh, friends, we are to be perfumed with Jesus Christ, announcing his goodness among those who are the most marginalized. And that's what the Father wants to smell at the judgment seat. I just gave a stinky example, Angie. <laughs> now... Jesus lives, and Jesus wants to live through his church. And let me close with this point of living like delivered people. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, as you did unto one of the least of these, you did it unto me. Some of you have been living this way, and if I could reach you right now, I would give you a holy high five right now. Thank you, Zach. Friends, I cannot underestimate what this means in the eyes of God, and in the eyes of the world, they will know that we are Christians by our what? Oh, come on, somebody pray louder. They'll know our Christians by our what? Love for one another and love for those who are marginalized, those who are broken, those who are hurting. Friends, let us live like delivered people. And now let's look at our second point in Exodus. Let's look at how people are people and not projects. People are people and not projects. Look at verse 25. If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be like moneylenders to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. And if you ever take your neighbor's cloak and pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down, for that is his only covering and the cloak for his body, and what else shall he sleep? Look at how it ends. And if he cries to me, I will hear him, for I am compassionate. You see, guys, God's covenant people in this Old Testament setting were supposed to see through the lens of deliverance. And look at what verse 25 says. My people who are poor. Friends, the power of greed to so deceive us that we would capitalize on those who are about to starve to death cannot be underspoken in our generation. Just as it is here, if you lend money to my people, the poor, you shall not, uh, you shall not add compounding interest on already difficult situations. 
Friends, we have to look at this and we have to say the poor among us or the poor here, they are people first, not projects to be profited off of. Paul, I mean, not Paul, the, the writer of Exodus, Moses, tells us that the day laborer who exchanges his cloak, he needs to get it back or he's going to freeze to death. Friends, are we this serious about greed that God is? For he says, I hear their cry. Do we see people as people and not projects? This is the power of greed. Greed sees them as a project. Mammon and the worship of mammon sees first profit and not people. Now, I'm not here to get into a debate on whether Christians should use interest. What I'm here to tell you is that we need to see people as in the image of God. They are God-bearers, those who Christ bled and died for. Greed would say it is profit first. Jesus says store up treasure in heaven. Now, why is Jesus so clear about us building up treasure in heaven? Because there are things that are eternal and there are things that are not. Friends, if some of you have ever seen an old dollar bill, what does it look like? It's a wreck. It's crumpled up. It's a piece of paper. It is fading and will break away. Silver and gold, it will pass away. But there is a treasure. There is a pearl of great price that will last forever. And we have to change bank accounts. And part of us changing bank accounts is transitioning like the children of Israel and seeing the poor, seeing the day labor as people first because that's who Jesus died for. Under the new covenant, let us have grace and not greed. Under the new covenant, let us see people not as projects, but for those who Christ compassionately died for. Now, I started quoting this just a few moments ago, but I'm going to read it again. The law or the ethos, the ethic of love in the kingdom of God, this is our banner, and this is what we're plunged under. John chapter 13, verse 34 would teach us to love people and see them as people because Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you would love one another just as I have loved you. Oh, I'm going to read it again. A new commandment I give to you, that you would love one another just as I have loved you. You are to love one another. Friends, the human project, the human campaign, is that the church would awaken in the fullness of the Spirit and begin to release the power of love. Amen. Come on. What we want is to be on stage. And what Jesus wants is for him to be on stage. What we want are celebrities, but Jesus has only got room for one on the throne. What we want is to be number one. And Jesus says, be the servant of all. This is the ethic of love. This is who we are in Christ. But it will advance the kingdom among the hardest and the most difficult situations because God gets the most glory out of that. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not break in. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. Friends, let's let the law of love change the way we see people as people and not projects. So let me close with this. The gospel teaches us that justice matters. The gospel teaches us that caring for the oppressed among us matters. Orphans and widows and sojourners, as our text says, and we can express that deliverance. We can express that love to people as people through the power of the gospel. So now, my friends, let it take action. Let us give. Let us serve. Let us go out into the highways and byways and be the deliverance that God intends his church to be. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for such texts as Exodus that would provoke us and point us to Jesus. Oh God, I pray that we can live as delivered people by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, for these situations are not easy, Father. They're called challenges for a reason, but you've called your church to be overcomers, and so we ask now, help us to live like delivered people. Help us to see people as people and not its or thems or some other group we set up, but only image bearers, those whom you bled and died for. And we ask for this help. We believe you hear the cries of your people, you who are compassionate. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.
Thank you so much.